gentlemen, welcome to episode 25 of the Handbags, Manbags, Bumbags podcast. Uh, this week, we are joined by a very special guest indeed, in former Staffs Uni graduate and current BBC Radio Derby sportsman, Chris Coles. Chris, how are you doing? Good evening, Ben. Hello, Rob. Yeah, um, very good. Thank you. 25, eh? You're rattling through them. Um... I know. I know. Yeah, started in late, early November and we've been rattling through the um, last couple of weeks and since the new year, we've been putting them on YouTube as well. Um, so things are going well here at the podcast mm. and we, we're happy to invite you as our first ever guest on the channel, um, on the podcast. Um, so it's a privilege on your part. Well, absolutely. I'm, I'm honoured. Thank you very much for the invite. It's an absolute pleasure. No problem. Uh, we wanted to get a former staff uni graduate on as our first guest or someone that had been involved with the university. Um, but we'll start off with a couple of questions. So for those that may not be aware, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and what made you get into journalism in the first place. Well, I think like like many starting out, you you harbour ambitions perhaps of playing professional sport at, at some capacity just by virtue of playing so many sports as, as, as a kid. And, you know, you, you end up at that age in your early teens playing pretty much every sport going, whether it be football, cricket, tennis. Um, and then, yeah, like many, you get the bug for sport and, and you, you have, you have desires to work in it. I must admit, I never, I don't think there was ever a point where I, you, and this is the same for lots of people, obviously, because very few make it, but I thought, right, you know, pro sports, absolutely the way to go. I always remember quite early on wanting to be mainly a sports commentator, um, and that was always at the forefront of my mind and, and not really trying to have dreams of being a pro football. It was always about dreams of being a, a, a commentator um, for some reason. I'm, I'm still not sure where the inspiration came from, but it was always it was always that. And then and from then on, it's, it's, I've been quite fortunate in the sense that it has been quite single minded. I've never deviated. It's sort of always something that I've wanted to do and have been very fortunate to, to be in this position obviously massively helped by by Staffordshire University and, and the help that they they gave me and the quality of their their course. And to be honest, you, you could have chosen me, you could have chosen a whole host of people that have, have come through the, the doors at Staffs and, and have, have progressed to really good careers in, in the media. So yeah, it was always an ambition of mine to to, to break into into the sports media world. Um, and then since then, yeah, you 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 kind of go through really working and striving to, to to hit that next level and luckily as i'm sure you guys can resonate with as well when it is your hobby and if you're not studying it or working in it you're watching it or you're you're, you're taking it in, in other ways it doesn't feel like a job per se it, it doesn't it, it it feels um it almost feels like you're cheating the system somewhat because you're thoroughly enjoying what you're doing but i mean obviously that is so important and, and it always pushes you to try and achieve because you actually enjoy what you do so yeah always always an ambition of mine and I think if, if anyone has that desire and drive to succeed in this industry, because it is a very competitive industry, then it always puts you, I think, quite far down the line because you, you're always going to have that little bit more extra edge and emphasis over someone that isn't too sure um, about about the industry. Do you want to give us a little, give our listeners a little bit of a tour for your career so far? Obviously, we'll cover in more detail later on, but do just a quick whistle stop tour of your career. Give us a bit of context. Uh, yeah, so I did the uh, undergraduate course at Staffs. Oh, goodness me, this is going to be horrible. 14 years ago, 2005, um, I started. So that's longer than that now, isn't it? So a long time ago, um, I did the undergrad. And the undergrad back then was was probably very different to what it is now because it was quite uh, in its infancy. Um, and it was still a very good course, mainly because of the quality of, of the lecturers that, that we had. I think it most of them if not all now probably have have, have departed I, I think mitch may, may still be knocking around yeah, um, is, yeah. the legend that is mitch price but he's, he's probably the only one now back from from when i was there um and uh, from the undergrad i then did the the postgrad in sports broadcast journalism I realized quite early on that broadcasting was where i wanted to go and the course the undergrad whilst offering a couple of modules on broadcasting wasn't that well geared to broadcasting i think it very much is now some of the stuff that i see you guys do is incredible um when it comes to the broadcasting side but back then it wasn't so much so i wanted to do the postgrad um and and did that and then from that was fortunate to get a job at birmingham city and their media team it was a job that was offered to the six people doing the, the sports postgrad which was a little bit awkward because we were all sort of going for the for the same role was very fortunate to to land that job at birmingham city they just won promotion to the premier league 2008-9 
Um, they'd just installed a big screen, so they needed an extra pair of hands. So spent best part of three, maybe even four years there in their media team. As is so often the case in football, you end up doing lots of jobs. So you end up, um, re- you know, shooting videos and interviewing and commentating and presenting. And it was a great learning curve, especially because Blues at that point went on to finish, I think, eighth or ninth in the Premier League, their highest top flight finish. Next season, they won the League Cup and got relegated. Following season, went around Europe. Um, very unlucky not to qualify for the knockout stages. So, And also, they went through a quite difficult takeover. So it was a great base to learn all of the, all of the, the different pieces. Uh, for, then took a job uh, for the local commercial radio station in Birmingham uh, called BRMB. It's now named Free Radio. Back in the day, again, when commercial radio had quite a lot of football commentary, and then ended up commentating on the five or four big Midlands teams, so Birmingham, Villa, Wolves and, and West Brom. Brilliant two years, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, then, like so many local radios, they, they scaled down their coverage, so um, there wasn't a job for me there anymore. So I decided to go freelance um, it, and then got very lucky with with some of the things that came my way. So I ended up working for Leicester City during the time that they won the Premier League and then went around the Champions League. A, just a staggering couple of years and, and something that I could never even have imagined when one first getting the call. Uh, did a bit of work down at, at Sky um, in their in their radio arm called Sky, Sky News Radio and IRN that provide lots of um, content for commercial radio stations and, and a few bits and pieces for local radio in the BBC, so WM and Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, and that took us up to 2017 uh, and then was lucky enough to get the job here at, at BBC Radio Derby be fronting their their sports coverage um and i've been here uh, ever since so embarking on well three and a half seasons just completed three and a half seasons um covering uh, derby county and burton albion and, and derbyshire and, and various other aspects of, of derbyshire sports so um it's been quite varied i've been quite lucky and so often is the case in this industry it's it's knowing the right people and being at the right place at the right time and all the rest of it um but yeah from from, from 2005 which yeah seems a <laughs> worryingly long time ago um yeah i've been fortunate enough to to have done quite a bit did you always know that you wanted to get into the speech sports media industry or was there anything else you considered from a young age no i i, I can honestly say ben absolutely not um and i, I realize that that's quite rare um because certainly a lot of my mates and i dare say you guys will be the same you'll know that People are still unsure, you know, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s still don't really know what they want to do in terms of a career. And and you always get the people that, that you know, work to live. So they take a job that they don't enjoy, but actually they quite like the, you know, the, the salary or they quite like the perks and, and they just work Monday to Friday and, and they put work to the back of their mind then or, or live to work. And, and they want to do something that they know they're going to enjoy. And I've always been of, of that way inclined, knowing that if I any job that I do, I want to make sure that I really enjoy it. Um, and in that sense, I can honestly say not once did I, I waver from wanting to, to break into the, to the sporting world. Um, and fortunately, however many years later, uh, that, that, that is still the case. Um, who knows? It may well change. But, but no, I, I was lucky enough to be quite single minded in what I wanted to do. Um, and, and luckily, um, it turned out that I, could, uh, I quite enjoyed what it was and, and lucky enough to, to forge a semblance of a career through it. It's definitely better when you know from a young age what you want to do. Definitely, you can see the difference. Like obviously, obviously, after only a few years ago for us, and going through the dreaded careers interviews at school, you can do so many. So many of my mates talking through those, coasting yeah. the way through, making things up. As I just knew early on, it's very much the same since about as soon as I realised I was wasn't going to be good enough to be a professional footballer. That's when it was like, well, if I want to, I can still work in football. There's a way around that, yeah. and gone from there. But obviously, you mentioned your career, but just before we go delve a bit deeper into your time here at Stas, what do you say is the, the best sporting thing you've covered, or sporting moment you've covered to date? That's a good question because uh, there have been there have been several that, that really stand out. Um, and I think you have to put one of Leicester City's achievements mm. um, in there just because it was... It, it was completely well obviously unexpected five thousand to yeah. one um i think what 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 really hammers it home for me is is that i remember getting the call um from from one of their guys in the media team as always it was one of those things where you know the guys in the media team knew someone who used to work with me and said oh well chris has just gone freelance so one they were looking for a commentator why not yeah. give him a call and i remember taking it and this was you just remember this was just after they nearly went down so nigel pearson yeah. had saved them and, and it was close run thing 
Um, and obviously Pearson had gone and Claudio Ranieri comes in. And I remember, you know, getting the call. And my first thought was, do I really want to be committing myself mm. to a team that could easily be playing in the championship next mm. season? So I actually originally said, if it's on a freelance basis, if I can do one every two or three games, then I'll, I'll mm. do it because I want to keep my Saturdays free just in case. Um and it always staggers me how close I came to going, actually, mm. I'm going to just wait and then would have missed out on the madness that was to mm. follow. So it has to be Leicester's journey. I mean, in terms of, of a game, it was difficult to pinpoint one in the Premier League season because they were just, they were so good for it all. Mm. There wasn't a moment really where you thought, well, that was the match winning performance because they were just so consistent. Mm. So I think it has to be a game in the Champions League and, and still my, my greatest uh, memory is, is the Champions League quarter final and, and to be able to commentate on a Champions League quarter mm. final. Um, was still fantastic and and the, the second leg of the last 16 round against Sevilla when um, they won the game on the night fantastic atmosphere I'll never forget it um, was sensational obviously couldn't quite beat Atletico Madrid but to be in these iconic stadiums and and you know lucky enough to be in the Vicente Calderon before um, Atletico Madrid moved to their brand new stadium uh, to be in Sevilla's old ground with just memories where you you have to go wow this try and soak this up because it's just incredible you don't know if it'll ever happen again so it would have to be i think that or the other one that comes close because it still remains the most incredible game of football i've witnessed is the playoff semi-final second leg between uh, leeds and derby when leeds Mm. had beaten derby easily three times in the Mm. regular season and Derby sensationally uh, win at Ellen Road, Frank Lampard, uh, Mason Mount pulling the strings, Harry Wilson there as well. And just for atmosphere and storylines, because we know there was so much history before it, was just unbelievable. And I can I can still, I still every now and again watch the highlights back and just think, wow, incredible game of football. And and to this day, we'll remember the atmosphere. The gantry at Ellen Road is just above the away fans. So the, the noise from the Derby fans, absolutely electric. So I think that those would be those would be the two I think that stands out the, the Champions League quarter final and the second leg at, at Leeds in the playoff just for certainly just for for the atmosphere at Ellen Road. Well, I'm a proud Leicestershire man myself, but chosen my dad's route for football, and you certainly saw the impact it had on the city with Leicester winning the title. But still pains me to this day the season before their winning season seeing Matty Taylor miss a penalty for Burnley which could have put Leicester down realistically. And <laughs> Burnley in the Premier League for that season. Still pains me to this day being in the the home end then, but it's obvious to see that Leicester have certainly gone through the rise and hopefully I see Burnley there in the future. Um, but let's touch a bit more on your staff's uni life now, Chris. Um, what made you choose staffs at the time? It was it was the course, Ben. It was absolutely the course because, uh, again, back in back in the day, there were so few sports journalism courses. I stand to be corrected. I think there may have been only three, possibly. I think one maybe down at Bournemouth and another one perhaps up at, at Central Lanks, Preston Way. But I think the staff's one at the time was the only one that was NCTJ accredited. And again, that, that's credit to the, the the lecturers there that they they realised that to, to get a course that was recognised by the by the NCTJ was was massive so I remember uh, looking and not really having a set plan actually and in, in I'm going to do sports journalism but thinking well do I do English and therefore have a a degree that is certainly transferable to journalism do I be specific and go right I'm going to find a journalism course I'm going to find a broadcast journalism course um, and in the end that's what I decided on and, and was going to go broadcast journalism and then actually by chance I think saw sports journalism and and thought well that's a no-brainer you know that's exactly what I, I wanted to do so it was very much based on on the on the on the, the fact that it was NCTJ accredited I remember looking around the the campus and seeing the the, the newsroom which again I imagine now is 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 phenomenal it, back then it was very good and it was again fortunate that the quality of lecturers there they understood you know, if we're going to train the next generation, we need to make sure that all the facilities they have, both TV and radio, are state of the art. And they absolutely were, um, which is why the numerous news days we did, certainly in in postgrad, and I think some of the clips I see from you guys doing the sort of the Soccer Saturday um, reruns and all the rest of it, just just phenomenal. I mean, I I do half of me enviously looks at at the stuff you guys do now and think, oh, I wish we had the chance to do that back in the day. But it it, it was very much that. And as soon as I saw the the, the quality of the the campus and, and the how seriously I think they 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 took um, journalism, and then I thought, yeah, this is absolutely the the, the right course and, and the right place for me. What else did you do while you were in your time at Staffs? Was it how were the like work experience opportunities, and did, what, did you find a healthy balance, or do were you overrun with your work? 
no it, it was it was it was good and one of the things i always say about staffs and again I, i'm not sure if it is the same these days because i know probably health and safety and all these things mm. have probably changed but in in our day what what made the course so good but also challenging but in a good way certainly in my postgrad days is that they pretty much said we're going to treat you as journalists from day one right now you are a journalist and therefore all the advice and all the, the constructive criticism we give you is going to be as if you're in the professional world that didn't half get you into shape and actually straight away the people that weren't sure about it dropped out and I think that was the lecturer's way of saying, look, this is not a career you can just float through because you will get tripped up. You'll get tripped up by the people that are very good at the job and love it and therefore are going to naturally get above you anyway because they want to. But also because, again, I mean, you, you guys know, you guys will know even at, at your relatively early stages, it, it, you would have seen it. It's just not it's not your nine to five. It is a tough, tough gig. So I've always appreciated that because, yes, it was challenging. And there were times that they'd set you things and, you, and you'd think, how are we going to do that? What are we going to do? Um, but they encouraged us to, to, to go and be journalists and, and not just find a local story about the, the local, uh, the, you know, the university football team. They wanted us to go to Stoke City. They wanted us to go to Port Vale and find real stories. They wanted us to be pains and, and just to experience what it's like to be a, a proper journalist. Um, and for the first few weeks and months, it was it was daunting because you know you're 18 19 years of age and yet you're trying to find proper stories but you got into the swing of it quite quickly especially when you come back with work and you think it was quite good and the lecturers would tear it apart and you think right okay that's that's the game we're playing but you you know it's one of those you don't it's not really it's quite difficult to perceive or quite difficult to judge your work from day one to your work after two or three years in your mind you haven't changed that much and then you you compare the two and you think wow actually you've come on you've come on leaps and bounds so in terms of the work balance i always thought it was it was great because it, it felt like we were working at university so there wasn't a great need to, to to kind of find other other things certainly obviously in the second or third year we were encouraged to find work experience and um being from Cardiff and, and being born in Cardiff, I, I'd already sort of sent a few pestering emails to BBC Radio Wales. So got a couple of weeks work experience there. Um, and and that was kind of it, really. I think mainly because in the undergrad, I wanted to do broadcasting. So in my mind, I'd already had a set plan of what I wanted to do. It was always another year at university. And therefore, I, I didn't push for a work placement probably as hard as, as others might have done. Um, as I say, goodness knows what the state of play is now. And, and obviously, you know, feeling for you guys in two levels. One, the fact that you've, you're in the university at this particular time in the world, which, which is, you know, my heart goes out to you massively for that. Um, and, and secondly, I know that lots of things have changed in terms of what work placements are possible. And certainly we get lots of requests and, and we have to just sometimes turn around and go, it's out of our hands, sadly. This all goes through a big database somewhere in you know Manchester and we get given who we get given and we can't do it any other way. But it was always the most disheartening, I think, for me, knowing that work placement was always tough on both parties. It was tough for the students and it was tough on the employers because it was, you know, both parties wanted to benefit and at times it was quite hard to find the, the right slots so no there was always enough at university to keep me sweet in terms of not needing to find other things but one of the things that we were always told and, and absolutely would say to anyone progressing that you, yeah you you don't work always comes first and if you get the, the opportunity to go on a work placement or the opportunity to to do any kind of freelance work you you take it with both hands and i'm sure the lecturers would encourage you to do that anyway because you know nothing nothing beats actually doing professional work and it, it obviously looks great then for the for the cv moving forward absolutely um you've done a lot of work with current and past students at stats how have you seen the progress of students coming through the sports journalism course throughout the years it's one of the it's one of staff's great um uh, great facets i think that they can justifiably point to, to the alumni of people that have come through and 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 look this is where they are um and that is that is an absolute credit to the university and it's it's a credit to um the lecturers it's a credit to the quality of the course and just the, my my undergrad and postgrad i mean my postgrad the six six of us that were on it um I'm here at, at BBC Radio Derby. There's another another lad called Rob who 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 is pretty much on on Sky Sports News books. He freelances for, for Sky Sports News regular on on Liverpool's TV channel as well. Uh, Emily Croydon, who's a regular, it worked full time at BBC Sport. Um, we had a Canadian Pam who works for ESPN out in Italy, um, and Andy Scott, who's who's Sky Sports boxing uh, interviewer. And if you watch any of the big fights, you will see Andy uh, conducting all the all the post uh, fight interviews. Um, and that's one year uh, and that, you know, that that's not a fluke that that really isn't. And you look back at all the years you can go back and you can pick 
you know, five or six that are in excellent jobs. And again, that's not a fluke. It, it, it's it's very much down to the, the to the quality of the course. Um, so that that's always I always think that um, it, it must be the the, the the proper flag that staffs wave when encouraging students to come and study is is what can be achieved um, if you put your heart and, and, and mind into it. So it's been great to see so many of not just my course mates, but previous years and, and certainly people have got in touch with me over the years and seeing where they are now. Um, it, it, it's great. And I think the strike rate must be incredibly high in an industry that is is tough to get into. So, um, yeah. It, it, and I always say it's the lecturers. It, I will. I can't praise Mitch highly enough because, as I say, it's it, it, it's it's down to their hard work and desire to see their students succeed. Um and certainly while you're there, it's great to tap up these guys, you know, form a, form a good relationship with them and, 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 and tap into their contacts book and their knowledge because that, that, it, that, that'll get you a, um, a long, long way. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's something that I think, and as, as I've seen in the past, they obviously point to the, to, to the success of, of, of lots of, of their, of their former students, um, which I think is going to be what decides a lot of students' minds where they go, because at the end of the day, it's, you want to get the job, you want to get into the industry and, and a, stu- a university that proves that it has the, the record of getting students into, into jobs, then that's the one you're going to go for. I guess it's on us to try and continue that now. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. No pressure at Obviously. all. Yeah, you did the both the undergraduate and postgraduate degrees here at Staffs. What were the sort of differences between the two, and how well did you feel that they prepared you for your future career? They were different, um, markedly different. I think mainly because the postgrad, obviously being one year, um, they crammed an awful lot mm. into that year, um, and the undergrad. Again, at the time, it's obviously changed. I think beyond recognition was was geared towards the written side of it that's not to say we, we did a few broadcasting bits and pieces i remember mitch taking us all to uh, stoke city to uh, to watch a reserve game um and then we we had to film various bits and pieces and film an interview with the manager and all the rest of it and then we had to go back and edit it and make a little package i think that was midway through our second year but from memory that was really the only um proper broadcasting bits we did i think we did a few radio bits and pieces but the main emphasis I remember being on the written side of it. Having said that, the dissertation did offer, um, I think it was, you know, 9,000, 10,000 words of, of, of ideally published content, or you could make a, um, I think it was a 30 minute radio or TV documentary. And, and, and I went down the radio route for, for that. Um, such was my desire to get into broadcasting. The postgrad was, it was intense and they warned us, this is going to be a tough year for you because you basically have two or three weeks of training where they train you how to use a camera. They train you on, on final cut pro, which was the editing um, software of choice. Um, not a great deal of, of, of practical training in terms of this is how you interview, because I think a lot of it was you, you absolutely go and learn that on the job. Um, so it was two or three weeks of training and then it was literally it, off you go go and be a journalist. And then every week we'd have a, a news day. Um, and then it would culminate in, I think two or three weeks straight of news days. And that was challenging because you had to find content and, you know, we're talking a proper news day. So TV bulletins twice a day, hourly radio bulletins. And yeah, that was, that was undoubtedly tough. You, there were lots of fallings out and, and lots of, of tensions that were very high during those, those two or three weeks, but it was ultimately the, the two or three weeks that absolutely made you. So th- there is a big difference. Um, and I think the, the, the postgrad really, once you came out of that, you knew if this was for you or not. Um, and again, I, I can only praise the lecturers for that because they made sure, as they said from the start, you know, your work day one will be judged as harshly as it is on day 364. Um, so don't, don't feel daunted by that it's just it's the only way we're going to get you better it's no point us going yeah that's really good it just isn't you know and it it prepares you then for the real world where you know full well your work if it's not professional standard quite often you get um told in no uncertain terms that it that it needs to improve so so yeah certainly the the undergrad being over three years was um not quite as intense and as i I keep stressing i'd be very keen to know actually how what bits they've kept from 2005 um as to what it looks like now i, I dare say not much has survived um but uh but yeah po- my postgrad was very focused on broadcasting obviously undergrad you, you learn lots of different mm. things uh, you joined birmingham whilst on the postgrad i believe um what did your role as audio visual producer entail was it a mix of like creating match day content and displaying stuff on the big screens around the ground essentially yeah so 
um, as mentioned, they they'd they'd won promotion and they're in the Premier League and they'd uh, bought a, a big screen to sit in the corner of, of St Andrews and there was only one member, uh, another Chris, uh, in the media team at the time and his remit was to look after um, the, the the website. So the, the, the Blues Player, as it was called, then when it was under the Player uh, brand. I know obviously you know club media now has come on so much since then. Um, and you only have to look at some of the some, uh, most Premier League clubs now will have their their own special TV channel, and you know it's obviously the big hitters um, do that really well. And and Birmingham yet needed another pair of hands, so so in I came, and yeah, and it, it was very much collating um, content for the website that then could be turned into content for the big screen, um, and that was yeah, filming player interviews and and making nice little packages and and creating a. A uh, an hour program that went out pre match every home match day between two and, and three o'clock, um, and it was great fun. And, and it, we were lucky that you know Chris is my age, um, and we we had you know we were both quite geeky in that sense. So we loved um, we loved playing around with graphics and making you know making the content really really good. Essentially, you know we were we 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 pour over the BBC and Sky's pre match stuff and try and make it as 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 close to that as we could chris was a whiz with photoshop and graphics and you know created loads of lovely things we you know we we, we stole skies you know when, when we used to record the players walking towards you when they did the graphics we stole all of that for our team news and all the rest of it and it was just brilliant to have someone there that you know and and, and the club trusted us to do whatever we wanted so it was great to have that freedom to, to do it and it was a brilliant three and a bit years and and it, it did change as it went through the years because i wanted to do commentary so we, we took the commentary that in house, it was with the local radio station. We did it, or I did it with with um, Michael Johnson, former centre back at, at Blues, um, and that was that was great fun. So my role definitely changed to more of a, a commentator then in the second half of, of that. But as I said, it was I, I couldn't really have asked for a better grounding because it was you did everything, and that was the best way to describe it. You wanted a crash course in in every part of of sports media, whether it be interviewing, filming, commentating, presenting, pretty much did all of that across. You know, the Premier League, the Europa League, the League Cup and the Championship, numerous manager departures and a big takeover when um, the now disgraced Carson Young took over from from Gold, Sullivan and co. Um, so, yeah, it was, was very fortunate that the, the job allowed me to be so flexible, but also that it threw so much um, at, at both of us to, to be able to, to cope with and, and ultimately then stand us in really good stead moving forward. Yeah, you picked three, you picked three and a half decent years there as well, like you mentioned, oh, yeah. the highest Premier League finish. A League Cup win, obviously the biggest upset. A um, brief period in Europe as well. Can you just take us through how the, the feel around the club over those years? Obviously, there was a relegation in there as well, which put a damper on things. But let's focus on the positives. Yeah, well, I mean, this is why I, I've said to uh, many people up here in in Derby um, that I, that I when all, whenever a club goes through a relegation or close to relegation, it is the staff of the club that I feel for having been through it because there can't be too many jobs where regardless of how good you are, regardless of, of how well you do your job, it still might be for nothing because you're relying on 11 players and the management team to, to, to win. And if they don't win, then your job is in jeopardy. That's difficult. That is tough to, to get your head around. Um, and at Birmingham, it was, yeah, it was, it was tough. Obviously the first two years were, were great fun, you know, finishing, yeah, as I say, I think they were eighth in the end in the Premier League. And, and then that second year was, was good because, you know, Dar- Derby, uh, Birmingham had, had, had signed pretty well. You know, the, the, the Alex McLeish was an up-and-coming manager at the time. He had great success at Rangers. They had the makings of a really good squad. You know, they just brought in Nikola Zigic, who was, who was you know, a, a huge presence up there. Ben Foster was, was excellent in goal and was man of the match in the League Cup final. They had a decent team and they just ran out of steam. That was sadly for them. that they, They'd beaten Arsenal in, and again... I probably would have to put that in, in, in one of my memorable games. It, it's probably because it's just so long ago now that I've, I've almost forgotten about it. But, um, but yeah, the, when they won the Carling Cup, it was it was sensational. And, and, and to be at Wembley experiencing that was just... Um, but I remember at full time running on the pitch with the camera um, and being sort of dragged back by very, very um, officious EFL um, officials that were, I, I, you know, claimed I had no right to be on the pitch. Well, I think they were right. I had, a, I had a badge, but it didn't allow me to go on the pitch. And I remember sort of fi- trying to film the celebration and, and being manhandled. I can understand why now, because the mm. EFL, wanted, they, were, they were worried that all the pictures with the sponsors would just be ruined by me in the front with a camera, you know, some 22-year-old that was just annoying everyone and getting in the way. Um, I remember actually we gave the camera to... Um, 
uh, to Seb Larson. We just said, look, Seb, take this and film. And in the end, it was the best thing we could have done because we got some amazing content. The EFL were furious, but they knew they couldn't do anything because the players were, and, you know, and Seb was going around filming the, the crowd. So obviously because the crowd can see it's Larson, they're giving it the big one. Um, he remember giving it to Liam Ridgewell. He was filming himself and we got it back uh, the next day thinking, oh, we have, you know, what a stroke of luck that is. What a great idea it was to give the players the camera. Um, and, and yeah, it's amazing how quickly it changed when relegation happened. I remember being actually at St. Andrews. Derby, uh, it's going to happen a lot. Birmingham were relegated at Tottenham and I was actually at St. Andrews for something completely different. I had to control the big screen for some event. And I remember watching Soccer Saturday and, and seeing the drama and it was still a, a ridiculous day. Wolves should have gone down, but somehow managed to score twice against Blackburn. And it was, I remember walking around St. Andrews at about six o'clock. Everyone had gone home and it was just me on my own in the stadium. And it just, it was so eerie because it was the realisation that this club is now a championship club. Um, and it was quite a moment because obviously you think about your own future. Um, and it was tough because people did lose their jobs. And me, uh, Chris and I were fortunate that they'd said at the start, look, we're going to need a media team still. We're going to need, you know, the AV team is only two people strong with Europe. We, you're you're going to be OK. So that did help. And it's amazing how quickly in football, as you guys will absolutely know, if you start winning games, it's amazing how quickly the feeling changes again. And, Dar and Birmingham got in Chris Hewton, um, who was a great, perfect fit at the time, um, who got his head down and worked. And, and it was a great season. They, they finished in the playoffs. They lost to Blackpool. They were shattered at the end of it because of their Europa League campaign. But to go around Europe, it was it was great. And um, and then Lee Clark took over. And it, again, they had a decent enough season, finished sort of mid-table. They had lots of youngsters coming through, like um, Jack Butland and Nathan Redmond and... Um, Jordan Much and uh, Ravel Morrison and it was it was good and then that was the season that I left and arguably left just in time before all the all the you know the fireworks started and, and they slipped but um yeah it was I can't speak highly enough of Birmingham I, I I love the place you form such great attachments with clubs and and the people and the fans and the friends I still have fantastic um and yes, you, you, you worry when the team aren't doing well because it affects everyone and you'd much rather conduct an interview with a happy manager than a sad manager um but no i i reflect on those years fondly and as i say it is amazing how quickly the atmosphere in a club can turn when it starts going back up which doesn't take much yeah in this game you mentioned that the staff get hit very heavily when um relegation occurs and obviously birmingham got relegated by just a solitary point that season how does that contrast for you from a journalistic point of view to the thrills of the cup final the pre earlier in the earlier in the season Incredible, Ben, and, and that's it. it, it it's the, the the contrasting emotions from, and we're talking what three months prior, possibly less than that. The the euphoria of that day at Wembley, and and no question, Birmingham were colossal underdogs. I remember at the time, Arsenal. I think were still going, possibly for the quadruple. I think they were still in the FA Cup. They were still in the Champions League and they were they were looking at the Premier League. So this was seen as the tournament, uh, the cup that, yeah, this is the one they've got in the bag. Absolutely no question. Yeah. And there were so many elements of that day that, that stand out for me. One of them being that Arsenal turned up in their tracksuits. And I remember uh, Alex and the team were furious at that because they thought, and Alex used it as his team talk. He said, look, look at Arsenal. They've turned up in their tracksuits. They think they've got this. They haven't even been bothered to put on a suit for Wembley. Obviously, Birmingham, you know, suited and booted. McLeish made sure that the team were aware that this was a huge occasion. And it was undoubtedly a massive occasion for a club of Birmingham size. Fans had not been to a, you know, a cup final, a major cup final for, for many, many years. Wembley was packed. And you always got this sense on that day that it was Arsenal, were, even the fans were just laissez-faire about it. We're going to win, no problem. And Birmingham, you know, this was, this was an event for Birmingham and it wasn't an event for Arsenal. Um, so the scenes on the full-time whistle, as I say, will, will live with me forever. The jubilation in the stands, the jubilation um, in the in the on the pitch and the and the and the dressing room afterwards, and and it was it was a great team and it was a good good dressing room full of good people, and you were just pleased for them that they, they experienced the day, and, and and you were pleased for the staff as well. So yeah, it, absolutely incredible. And then yeah, it was just thought then because Birmingham were not in huge trouble. And in the end, of course, you, you, ben, you say it was a solitary point. It was actually a goal because had, had Wolves not, had Birmingham not needed to push for a winner, then I don't think Pavlichenko waxed one in a, in sort of the 94th minute because for a long time they were they were OK. It was only then when Wolves scored a second to go 3-2 down against Blackburn mm. that suddenly Birmingham were down on goal difference. So one mm. goal really relegated them. And that's the worst because obviously you go back through the season going, well, where have they conceded a stupid goal? 
Um, but you're right. Then, then to to have that that in the same season, the, the euphoria of the cup final to then the desolation of, of relegation. I wasn't at White Hart Lane. I can only imagine um, the scenes. But as always with Birmingham, that there was a sense that, and I think all clubs have this mantra anyway, that oh, it's Birmingham. We we only do things the hard way. And I just remember looking at the scenes on the TV, and there was still that resilience from the the crowd. Um, and that you know that their keep right on anthem was sung around White Hart Lane, and and I think most fans, if not all fans, if you were to offer them relegation but also win a major cup final, they'd take it. I know there was debate recently about well, you know, what's better if you're Leicester, what's better, winning the FA Cup or qualifying for the Champions League? Ninety nine point nine percent of fans, I am sure, would say cup. I want glory. That that feeling at Wembley is is second to none over anything else. For Birmingham, obviously, don't want to get relegated, but but yeah, there can't be too many clubs that, that experience the highs and lows. So from a journalistic point of view, again, difficult because at the moment, at that point, I was part of the club rather than outside it. Mm. But yeah, it, it was, I imagine for the guys covering covering it, it you couldn't have asked for a, um, a contrast in, in feeling and a contrast in the stories that you would have written from cup final win to just a few weeks later, um, uh, you know, a, a very, very, in the end, costly relegation to, to the championship. Mm. Well, you mentioned Leicester there. Let's skip forward to your time there. And clearly you seem to have just a sixth sense of knowing when a club's on the rise, so <laughs> Birmingham and then Leicester. But so what how what was that like from obviously we know what it's like from not even not even being Leicester fans or Ben's mentioned the city. What was that like being inside the club for that season in twenty sixteen, seventeen? Or fifteen, sixteen, sorry. Yeah, fifteen, sixteen. It it was yeah, it was quite something. It was a little bit different to my Birmingham days because I was freelance, so I was doing lots of other things. So really, the only the only bits that I saw were were match days. Um, so I didn't really. It wasn't the same feeling of being in the kind of inner sanctum that comes with being part of the football club. Um, but no, as 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 mentioned, you you know the start. I'll skip the start. But yeah, it, it was something that I I was keen to do on a semi regular basis because I was still doing a few other bits and pieces on a Saturday, um, and it was it was great. It was. They, they started um, in terms of the Leicester City technical side of it um, as quite a, a rough um, project in terms of that they pretty much had an ISDN kit and and you pretty much turned it on and off you went. It's developed into, you know, Leicester now are one of the, the, the leading forces in the, in the, in the club TV world. Um, and they've invested so much money, obviously, the, 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 the cash they've got from the, um, the Seawalt Anna Prabhar family, um, uh, is is brilliant and they've done so much the family for the city and 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 for the football club and the football club are benefiting from that hugely and their media team is as well but that year it was i just remember thinking like i'm sure loads of other people did it's going to come down at some point something is going to give here has to give um no doubt leicester were fortunate that lots of teams were going through a weird transition period so uh, i think chelsea had won the league previously and then jose was sacked in sort of October, you know, Chelsea was sort of 16th at the time and, and clearly they weren't going to challenge. Uh, Manchester City were, were going through a, a little bit of a transition, which is why it was really Arsenal's and Tottenham's to, to go for um, and really should have been if you look at the two squads or the three squads when you throw in Leicester. So we were going through the season and again, because in the early part I was doing every one in three games, it was it was difficult really to, to judge. It was only after Christmas that Leicester was still top of the league and it was great. And you were just waiting for the moment that it was not, it was just going to fall down. They, they stick, I think, three past Man City. I think Robert Huth scores a couple of goals and they win three in at the Etihad. And then that must have been February time. And you, that's when you're thinking, oh, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Maybe we do have to sit up and take notice. I remember being at uh, the Emirates on Valentine's Day and Arsenal, clearly one of the, the teams chasing Leicester. They, I think they won the game from memory on Valentine's Day. It was close. I think I remember a penalty going and maybe Ramsey scored. But anyway, someone scores and Arsenal win the game. And there were some jubilant scenes from Arsenal that day. Um, and there was, in the end, quite a famous picture taken in the Arsenal dressing room of all the players almost celebrating like they've won the league. And I've no doubt that Leicester then used that as ammunition to say, I reckon they've got you. And at that point, I think the feeling was they had because suddenly it was, well, the big team are now had either overtaken Leicester or a point or two behind Leicester at the time. And then it was, right, there we go. Job done. Arsenal are going to romp to victory. Of course, it didn't happen. And Leicester just kept on with that brilliant team spirit they had with the, the in midfield, uh, Vardy and Okazaki up front. You had Mares obviously playing really well. Mark Albrighton going up and down. Very solid defence in Morgan and Huth and Schmeichel, uh, Fuchs and Danny Simpson. It was such a team, a real team. I think that in the end that got them over the line, it was the fact that they were the only team in that top six seven that were playing for one another and, and and had been playing 
for us quite a long time, which is why lots of credit is given to Nigel Pearson for pretty much building the foundations and then Claudio Ranieri taking it to that next level. Um, it was unreal, you know, I, I can't argue, but being at Everton, uh, being at the, the final game of the season against um, uh, against Everton, um, Andrea Bocelli blasting out, um, you know, operatic anthems, um, pouring down with rain, um, Ever- Leicester winning the game. Yeah, it, it was it was just one of the, again, it, it's tough in life, I always think, to do this because you're so swept up in, in the moment or, or swept up in, right, I need to think of what all the things I need to do now. Or you get your phone out to, and you, you just think, I need to just, I'm watching Leicester City lift the Premier League trophy here. What is going on? So, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was truly remarkable. And, and then to follow it up with a, um, a relatively successful Champions League era a, a campaign was, was yeah, and, and Rob, you're not the only one of my mates to, to, to joke about I don't know how you managed to go from one to the other I mean it's been negated now slightly by Derby I think it's safe to say um, but yeah just an incredible couple of years still have lots of good friends at Leicester and um, one of the clubs I clearly look out for and and, and wish all the best and, and just pleased to see that in this era of, of owners being bashed left right and centre to see you know the Sea Watana Prabhar family given the tragedy that, that, that they suffered a couple of years ago to see where they are now and just to see you know a, a good club and a good city succeed in that way is is great. Obviously, you know, not all these Midlands rivals will agree with that, but um, but I think it's a it's a great story and shows that with good owners and and, and money spent the right way, um, anything can happen. And it gives hope. You know, and you mentioned you know Burnley, it, it could have been, and that's the that's why the European Super League was laughed out of town because Leicester City achieved what they did, and that is open to to any club that that does it the right way. I think single handedly for me the. Trevor and Prabha family are the best owners in the Premier League for me. Yeah, and hands down. Hands down. And just, I think there's one game in particular that epitomised that season for Leicester in 15-16. And I think it was the home game against Norwich, where mm. I think it was that loud when I think it was a Joa scored the winner. That's it right. It caused yeah. an earthquake. earthquake. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the moment that you pretty much knew that Leicester had won the title or were pretty much there. But... From a more commentary point of view, how much did it help your develop your skills week in week out with commentating? Yeah, that that was that was huge, and 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 obviously I'd spent you know two two years previously to that um, commentating on 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 free radio um, across a variety of, of the Midlands teams, and, and that was that was great fun. With Leicester, it was nice in the sense that you you ended up having to do a little bit less research, obviously, because you knew them so well. Um, and, and by the time you got through the season, you know, you could rattle off stats and facts and scores that you knew about anyway, because you, you were, you know, had the luxury of, of watching the game, but no, to, to, to regularly do it. And something like that, um, you get into quite a nice uh, rhythm and, and routine with it. Um, although one of the things that I've always been told, which resonates, I think across lots of uh, different disciplines, um, especially with commentary and any form of broadcasting, um, is when you listen back, and all I think all commentators will do this, when, when they listen back to their work, focus on the bits that you like only because you don't want to use them again, which is interesting because I think most people would naturally listen for the bits that sound wrong and then you think, oh, no, I don't want to say that again. But actually the, the, true is, the opposite is true because if you say something that resonates quite nicely, you don't want to say it again because it gets lodged in your mind. And then that's, the, that's the, the phrase you reach for when you're struggling. Um, and he's absolutely right. I mean, how many of the, the, the famous iconic lines can you, you know, can you list over the last few years? And there are plenty fittingly, perhaps the one that springs to mind is, is Martin Tyler's Aguero moment. Mm. Now, yes, I know he did it. That That's fine. That's slightly different, but if he'd done it, you know, a year later, it would have, you just can't, you know, would have completely ruined that moment and also the previous moment. Um, you know, no one will ever in the history of sports commentary say they think it's all over. It is now ever again. So it was useful in that regard that because I was doing it so regularly, I was spotting that at times I was, when you're looking for something to say, your brain searches for the, the first thing that comes to mind. And if you've got something lodged that you've liked from the previous week, easy to go with it again. And then, you know, you, you, it, it, it becomes um, disingenuous, really. It's not the point of commentary. And, that lots of commentary lines can feel scripted because they are scripted. And actually the joy of commentary is to be in the moment and to, and to reflect um, what the fan is feeling. So in that regard, it was great to do it so regularly and, uh, and being able to, to hone the skills that, um, that can help you moving forward. But as I say, more for the elements that I hadn't really considered rather than the ones you look out for. Cause as I say, I think most people naturally would look out for the things that did sound 
quite nice when the discipline actually is the reverse and, and the bits that, you know, the bits that, 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 that you do like, just make sure that you park it and don't, don't form in your mind because then you can easily go back. And I'm sure it's the same with everything, writing and, and any kind of, of sports media. It's, it's leaving the moment to one side and, 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 and trying your best to, to focus on, on what's moving forward. But no, in terms of the commentary, yeah, loved every minute of it and, and was just, as I say, very fortunate that Leicester did what they did over those two years. I could sit and talk about Leicester all day, really, but I know we are pushed for time. But something else I know our listeners will really want to know about is your time at FA TV, particularly your interview with Gareth Southgate when he was first starting out as England manager. So what was that like? Obviously, such a high calibre guest. You're still a relatively young journalist at the time as well. Obviously, what was it been what, four or five years ago now when Southgate was first taken over? Terrifying, Rob. Absolutely <laughs> terrifying. I don't think I've been as nervous um for something because well for a couple for a couple of reasons yeah it was still uh, yeah so oh yeah tw- it must have been mid mid to late 20s perhaps so t- 26 27 possibly a touch older um and a friend of mine who had been we'd been together at blues he's actually um england's senior uh, press officer now andy walker you often hear his voice across england press conferences um, and Andy and I worked together at, at Birmingham City and, uh, and and get on well. And yeah, I, he I think they were looking for someone just to anchor a video. And, and Andy said, oh, well, I know Chris is freelance. I'll give him a shout. So um, that's what happened. And actually, I had very little clue of what was going on. I got, I got an email saying, oh, Chris, we need someone. You know, we're looking for a, a presenter, someone just to front a video or, in, or interview Gary Southgate. Will you, you know, are you around? I was like, yeah, sounds great. Absolutely fine. Um, so I remember you know putting on and because i was quite radio based i didn't really have much radio uh, tv presenter gear so i remember sort of throwing on a shirt and a gray suit jacket and going to st george's park first time i had been to st george's park and and not really knowing what to expect and it was only then when i sort of walked into a dressing room and they, they set up all the gear and then was told oh by the way it's a it's a facebook live um you're the it'll be the first interview that he does as england manager um and here's your ipad and all the questions will be coming in if you can just select the you know make it a nice interview and just select the questions i remember my heart just going and feeling kind of oh, i don't think i'm cut out for this at all like I, I don't i don't feel remotely prepared for this and just thinking yeah just, just being terrified and thinking what am i doing why have i got myself into this well i just said no should have just said i was busy should have just said no um and it was only it's only really after the event that you look back and and you, you wish you'd enjoyed it more mm. but because i was so terrified of, of, of everything about it the fact that it was it was it was live um the fact that it was the england manager um and the fact that it was his first very first interview since becoming England manager. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was scary. Um, fortunately, he is, Gareth is absolutely as he comes across in on TV. He's a, he's a, just a very, very nice chap. Um, and made me feel very at ease as we, as we started and, and we had a good conversation at the end as well. And he was absolutely great. Um, and, and yeah, it's one of those I still look back on every now and again and just shudder a little bit. Cause I, I, I agree. I think I, I look, I look so young I think is the biggest thing for me. And I just think, you know, and as a few ad lib lines I throw in that just feel, you know, as, as everyone will do as they move through their career, you look back at things it, probably two or three years ago, let alone five, six and think, Oh, I should have done that slightly differently. Um, but it was, it was, it was great fun looking back, but I remember at the time feeling absolutely terrified. And, and for the, luckily then the second one they did, which was an England squad announcement um, felt slightly more comfortable knowing what to expect. Um, but they were, yeah, they were they were great fun. It was great fun to do, um, and uh, and yeah, St George's Park is as impressive as it looks from the out, out, from the outside. And Gareth Southgate is as as nice a person um, as he is uh, when he comes across on on TV. How do you go about approaching an inter- a high caliber interview like that? Because you can't obviously blatantly look like you've got a set of questions in front of you. Do you have to go about memorizing certain questions that you want to ask Gareth? Yeah, I, I think this is something that is easier i think as you as you get slightly older because there's and, and, and i think everyone's guilty of this and, and me included and and this is it still very much happens in in in, in big interviews where you you want to get everything right and, and the list of questions are written down i've always thought um the best interviews you get are when you you don't necessarily have a set regimental list of questions the best content you get is when you have a conversation with people you just talk naturally to people that that's quite often the best the, the best content you get because an interview an interviewee is is far more likely to to engage in normal conversation and therefore give you much more 
if you do ask normal questions rather than ask one sort of question that that's very um you know stilted and then he answers and then you want okay thanks next question and it's completely you know you don't really get much stuff so certainly now if i'm if i'm conducting an interview i'll try and make bullet points but then speak around them and it's so important to listen i mean again this is something i know that um you know you guys will be taught within an inch of your life especially in journalism you just listen and if so often things are missed because you're worrying about your next question and actually there are so many things that you need to go back and revisit and um and that's always so important so in my mind even that with with gareth southgate it was slightly different because i was told there will be questions on your ipad um and just use your to the best of your ability choose the ones you want to ask of course it being facebook live there was lots of well why has he got the job you know all this ask him why he's got the job ask him this that and the other um so you had to kind of be a bit cute with it and have two or three questions on standby and, and i did to be fair i knew the score i mean obviously it was in house which was the first thing to say so it's not as if you could you know nail him down with anything controversial but yeah i remember going into it with i think two or three on standby obvious things like you know having been the under 21s manager are you looking at, at youth for for, for, your, you know, for your next squads um, I was told to to try and find some of the slightly lighter questions. So I remember asking him about what's your favourite roast dinner, quite you know, quite innocently. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was it was always one that you, you'd always have your next question in mind, but not absolutely formed, just in case you missed something that it could easily be picked up on on later. Um, and I know I think that's still the, the best way of going about it. It, it. You've just got to trust yourself that you're not going to run out of things to to ask. Having said that, if you're sitting down with clearly a very, for instance, here at Radio Derby, when we interviewed or when I interviewed the chief executive, Stephen Pearce, in January about a few things that were that were very, very important. I made sure there was a list because it is important. You know, you don't you don't want to be in the big interview completely frozen. Uh, but certainly if you're if you're confident enough in the subject, it's not that controversial. Um, it's so much better to have a, a an idea of what you're going to ask, but without committing fully to it and, and just have a, a nice conversation. And certainly that's, that was the approach that I took then to that, to that England interview. So the big question is though, did you get, did you manage to get Gareth's phone number afterwards? Be a brilliant contact for future. He would be, wouldn't he? No, I didn't. I, I thought it'd be a little bit cheeky. If, um, <laughs> having, uh, having been asked to do it uh, on a, an, an in-house basis, mm. if then I, I played him for his number. Um, and of course, it was during that point as a freelancer that I thought, well, I'm not sure what use I really have for this. Um, obviously, later down the line, you kind of think, yeah, I wonder, I wonder. But in a room full of sort of seven or eight FA staff, I thought it might just be a little bit um, pushing it a little bit too far. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure a more sort of bolshy journalist uh, would have would have certainly asked the question. Whether or not he would have got the right number, um, I'm not sure. But it was probably worth an ask. It would have been a useful one looking into the yeah. World Cup a couple of years later, Absolutely. definitely. Absolutely. Um from working in freelance, you moved back to full-time radio work in 2017 um, when you joined Radio Derby. You've spoken to Stash Uni before and you, you said you felt like a supply teacher, quoted, within freelance. What made you make the switch back to full-time work in radio? Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's each to their own in that regard. And, and the supply teacher feel um, works for some because they're quite happy just using their skills dropping in and out and not worrying too much about it. I guess for me, especially having been at, at, at Birmingham in particular, where you had your own baby, if you like, to, to mould as you pleased, it was quite strange and disheartening then when you go to different places and you realise that they weren't doing the things that you thought they should be doing and you try and change it and you either wouldn't have the time, you wouldn't have the ability to do it because you know, you're only there for a day and then you were going somewhere else. Um, so yeah, it, and, and at times you were, you were doing things that, you didn't necessarily thought or didn't necessarily think sounded correct or, or you thought could be done a lot better and, and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, that, that when that full-time opportunity came up um, and especially at, at the BBC, which is, is, is quite rare, a BBC sport job, one that was relatively close to home. I was living in Birmingham at the time was a full-time uh, presenter gig um, in an area where sport is very important. You know, Derby County plays such a huge part in, in many of, of our listeners lives. Uh, with a county cricket club as well, which is always useful in the summer. Um, you know, Burton now being the League One club, plenty of, of local athletes. You know, we, we've had two or three recently at the European Aquatics Championships in Adam Peaty, of course, and, and we've got several, several other swimmers and high-profile athletes and all the rest of it. So it was a great area to go into. Um, but yeah, mainly it was, it was, I wanted to make, I wanted just to have 
a routine and something that I could call and craft as my own. And I remember speaking to the then sports editor and, and he said, look, and, and he was someone I actually worked with back in commercial radio, again, small world. And it's amazing how, how many links you can find in your career. And, and it's, it is such a small world, which is why it's always so important to be nice to everyone because you're never too far away from someone who knows someone. Um, and, and Aaron, the, the sports editor at the time said, look, we trust you, whatever you want to do, you know, we like what you've done at, at commercial radio. We, I know what your skill set is. We like what you've done previously. If you think it's right, then go and do it. And I, I can't stress how good that was to have the editors that trusted what you did. Cause then you could write craft something, craft a sports program that you wanted to make and, 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 and make it sound how you wanted it to sound. Um, so that was the big reason. I think it was time to do something, uh, um, in, I enjoyed freelance. It was probably getting to the point where I, I didn't realize actually how stressful it was traveling from place to place and doing stupid hours and all the rest of it. Mm. So it was good to have some routine, but no, definitely the, the driving factor was, as you've said there, um, I, I what, it was time to find something that I could craft and, and, and do for a, a set period of time um, rather than just than from going from place to place. I think I'll return to freelance. Don't get me wrong. I think I, I do mm. suspect that, the freelance life will, will be back with me um, at some point. Um, you never know in this game um, how quickly things change. So I certainly am not averse to it. But yeah, at, at that time, it was very much that feeling of I want something that I can do for me um, and can, can can see my work stretch out over a set amount of time rather than just doing a shift at Coventry Warwick on the Tuesday mm. and doing something completely different at WM on the Wednesday, then something completely different at Sky on the Thursday. And I thought, no, now, now's the time for for change uh, and clearly right place, right time. Um, if that job hadn't come up, then who knows? I, I obviously would have still carried on freelancing until um, something like that would have come up again. Obviously you picked at a very eventful time for it again. There, Obviously you've, obviously, we all know what happened this season, staying up on the last day. Obviously we've also a couple of years ago, there was a playoff final in there as well, the chance to make it to the Premier League. So again, your streaks continues in a very eventful spell. You can say that again, Rob. Yeah, it was um, from, yeah, I mean, what, the three and a half seasons, there's been two playoff campaigns. They got to, in the half season I was there, Gary Rowett got them into the playoff semis, lost to Fulham. Um, then you had, yeah, the Lampard saga um, yeah. and that season where they, you know, that was a great season. They beat United at Old Trafford in the Cup. They, they nearly beat Chelsea um, and obviously got to the final against Villa, having beaten Leeds in that dramatic semi-final. Um yeah, and then Rooney rocks up, and then we've got the Wayne Rooney era, um, and there's been so much off-the-field stuff, whether it be mm. um, boardroom squabbles, EFL appeals, um, whether it be uh, drink-drive incidents. They've, they've mm. certainly been in the news um, in regard to, to that uh, recently. Uh, yeah, it, it's not dull, and there are at times you just think, just can we just have three weeks of calm, please? Just Can we just, you know, <laughs> something, just a, a few you know, weeks of nothing happening, but... Um, never seems to be the case. So, yeah, it's uh, it's never dull, as they say. What would you say this, these, the atmosphere is around Derby at the moment with a number of failed takeovers? Would you say there's somewhat of negativity around the club? I think there's a lot of exasperation around the club from the fans, definitely. I, I think they've they've reached a point and, and this last couple of years have clearly not helped or last 18 months where they haven't been allowed in to, to Pride Park. And I think... It's an obvious thing to say, but they, they clearly would have made a big difference. I think there are some clubs that have missed their fans massively. Um, I think you can put Liverpool right in that category. I think one of the big reasons they've they've not hit the heights is because they haven't had that Anfield crowd behind them. So I think Jurgen Klopp has said as much. And I think Derby are one of those teams. I, I, I do believe that had the fans been at Pride Park, they wouldn't have been in the situation they would have been in because that, that the crowd would have, have got them over the line. Um, the East Midlands are, are blessed with with three very well supported football clubs in, in Forest, Leicester and Derby. And, um, you know, and, and for Derby to average 25, 26,000 in the championship is good going is no question. Um, so for the season that they've had without being there and, and all the, yeah, all the shenanigans off the field, um, there is a, there is a low ebb around the place definitely. And, and it, for you know, two failed takeovers isn't helpful. Um, I think the fans are losing a little bit of, of confidence in, in, in the way the club is being run. There's been lots of frustration in the boardroom as well. I know that, that these deals haven't been done. So there is a feeling over the next few weeks that if they can get some clarity, if they can sort a takeover with some interested parties, if they can find out whatever sanctions they might get from the EFL um, when it comes to, to next season, whether it be points deduction, transfer embargo, fine, all cards are on the table still. Um, 
and then start next season with a little bit of a, a more sound footing, mm. then um, I think it would be a, a slightly easier season for the fans to take. Uh, what I would say is, and, and this is always a difficult one, I think, to, to, to square with fans, is I think if you were to give lots of football fans Derby's last five or six years, they'd go, that doesn't sound too bad, actually. I think there's been three or four playoff campaigns. The, the, the costly defeat to QPR about, what, six, seven years ago. There have been other semi-final defeats. They'd lost to Hull in the semi-final a few years back, then Fulham, then the playoff final. They've always been there or thereabouts. And I think a lot of clubs would have taken what Derby have achieved. Obviously, now where they are, some will argue, many will argue, they've, they've, they've overspent to, to get to that point. And this is now the comeuppance for doing that. Um, but yeah, certainly after the season they've had and all the off-field issues, there's there's a definite low feeling about the place. But as always, as mentioned with Birmingham and, and Leicester, it, you start winning games and if Derby can sort out all the off-field stuff, start next season okay and, and get fans back in at Pride Park and start winning, then the feeling changes so, so quickly because fans just want to watch a winning team. Um, and it'll be the same for you know Fulham fans, West Brom fans, Sheffield United fans. You know, Rotherham, Wickham and, and Sheffield Wednesday, the relegated teams. Yes, it'll hurt for a few weeks. Um, you know, Ben, I'm sure you're the same. You know, Burnley's various ups and downs. It's amazing how quickly then it can change once you're back in and watching a winning football team. Well, fingers crossed things can go, start going positive over the summer and then push on from there. But I want to turn the attention back to you just to finish off. What does the, what does the future hold for you in over your career? Have you still got things you want to achieve? Uh, yeah, very much so. I, I don't think you ever lose that 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 drive and ambition to to, to keep going, um, and it, it's something that that is always pushing me to the to the next the next thing. Um, and and sure, there are the, I don't know I'd I'd love to progress to a to a, a, a national level. Um, I love what I do at the moment at BBC Radio Derby, but the ambition is always there to to progress to you know to further in the BBC. That that's obviously first and foremost. Um, what what I'd love to do, but at the same token, or by the same time, by the same token, I'm in no immediate rush to do that. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be in this position. I love being here at, at, at Radio Derby. Um, I've got fantastic colleagues. I've got a football club that keeps us very busy. Um, and in this current time, it, it, it's undoubtedly very difficult um, to, to to perhaps think too much about the future because most of us are still treading water to to, to be in the here and now. Um, so you never say never in this industry. I've, I've, you know, I've been in it long enough to know that your best laid plans are often thrown out the window at the drop of a hat because things do change very quickly. Um, and it's just about how you kind of, you know, adapt to that and, and, and move forward. But no, certainly things that, that, um, that I, I want to, I want to achieve and want to get at, um, and, and they'll, they'll very much remain with me, um, until that, that day arrives. Um, if it arrives, you know you, ne- you never know with these things. You've only got to keep dry- pushing and keep believing in yourself and and, um, and and hope for the best. As I say, there's probably an awful amount of a luck that comes with it as well, just being in the right place at the right time. But but no, and I think that's the same for everyone, in, especially in this this industry. You've you've got to keep pushing and driving and striving to achieve because it keeps you sweet, keeps you honest, and keeps you working to the best of your ability. Um, if if deep down the, the the driving factor is is you know self satisfaction if you're doing it because you want to achieve and you've got your certain standards and your high bar um, no one else matters and it's all about what you do then you know you go a long way in this industry because you'll never let your your standards drop so uh, yeah we'll see we'll see what happens um as i say never say never in this in this industry because you just never know what's around the corner absolutely just one thing to finish um if you could give a piece of advice to an aspiring journalist like myself and rob what would it be yeah, I thought I thought that may have been coming at, at some point. Um, it is genuinely to never give up. I know it's quite cliched, and it, it, it's it's one of those that you hear and you're like, yeah, well, that's you know, all very well. But I, I, I sincerely, sincerely mean it. it. It's so easy to be demoralised in this industry, um, and you just you just cannot. Um, and the, the people you speak to, and the letters you send, and the emails you send, um, yeah, I guarantee, sadly. 50, 60 percent, you may never, ever hear from them, but you just cannot let that get you down. Keep at it and keep going. Um, you know, th- there's there's an art in, in, in this business to, to being a being a pest, but being a polite pest. And that is if you have somewhere you want to go and you have you know an idea of where you want to be, um, 
you know, speak to the people that are either in the roles or speak to the people that are um, giving the jobs. You know, they're only hu- they are human. They're not monsters. Talk to them, speak to them, introduce yourself, email them. If you don't hear back, wait a couple of weeks to, you know, one to one, two month. Go again. Just keep going and keep going. And I guarantee if you have the desire and you have the drive, then the luck will go with you. I, I promise you that. So it, it very much is just don't if, if you want to succeed and want to get to get far in this game just keep going and, and, and don't let the at the rejections and goodness knows I've had so many um, and, and you, you both sadly will as well. It's the way the world works. You just can't let that get to you and keep going because sadly, because it's such a competitive industry, there are lots of people that want to succeed. And if you, if you just drop that desire and work rate slightly, they'll be the person that doesn't that takes the job that really you should do. And, and you might be 10 times better at it than person X, but because they've been persistent, they, they, they tend to, to get it. So um, yeah, for me, it, it, it is all about in, in this weird old world of media, just, just don't, just don't take the rejections to heart. Keep going, uh, keep speaking to people. Um, it's all about building relationships and building trust and introducing yourself and 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 being as i say in the right place at, at the right time so yeah as cliche as it sounds it, it would generally be just you know keep going because you'll look back at the day that you probably felt oh i'm not sure this is for me or you, you had your you know 10th rejection because that'll be the the, the moment that, that spurs you on to to, tr- to try and uh, get on in this game so that would be what, what i'd say is yeah don't don't give them don't give up well we're making a bit of a habit of these longer episodes the last couple of weeks um <laughs> I know myself and Rob are incredibly grateful for your time, Chris, um, and we'll hope to keep in touch for the future. Um, mm. Thank you ever so much for coming on this week. Um, absolute pleasure having the opportunity to interview you and get to know a bit more about your career. And we wish you all the best for the very future. That's very kind of you both. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Rob. And no, no, the, the pleasure, honestly, is all mine. It's um, it's an honour to be um, to be on your your twenty fifth episode. And if it indeed is your first guest, then wow. Um, that that is that is um, that is uh, a, a great honour and uh, and yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, and yeah, please do keep in touch as uh, as I always cast my eye over um, the latest talent coming out of, of staffs because it means a, a place that means a lot to me. So um, no, it's been great to chat. Pleasure is ours. But for this week, guys, it is the end of episode twenty five. Thank you very much for sticking with us this week. We hope you enjoyed this week. We certainly have. Um, so take care and goodbye. Bye.